Alex, welcome. It's always good to catch up on, on Red Panda and the company. We have an opportunity today to talk about a ton of different parts of, of Red Panda. Obviously, we've worked together for quite a long time over many chapters of the company. And so today we can talk a little bit about Red Panda's history, about Red Panda as it stands today, and some of the you know, amazing parts about it, and then sort of where you're looking forward. But to start out, can we just ground ourselves in what Red Panda is and, and uh, give us a sort of who the company is today? Yeah, so the company originally started as a Kafka replacement for mission critical systems. And it was really just born out of this frustration of working with, with alternative systems where like to the practitioner, it felt like systems whack-a-mole to get something up and running. And so we started the company in 2019 as a Kafka replacement for mission critical systems. And over time, the company has evolved into being a platform for these data intensive applications. And so if you're moving a ton of data through the enterprise, uh, you know, Red Panda would, 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 would be a good fit. And the types of customers that we've been able to onboard, you know, the, all of the largest electric car companies in the world, the largest banks, um, you know, we protect uh, transitively whitehouse.gov, the largest sporting events, largest bank, largest payment uh, company in the world. And so we've just been super lucky to get a chance to, to partner with, with some of the largest companies. It's a special day. We're celebrating you raising your Series D. Can you share a little bit about what this moment means for you and for the company? The way I generally think about the arc of the company is we had Act One, and Act One was really helping organizations with this data intensive systems, right? And so it was like, okay, you're doing uh, fraud detection in real time, you're producing, like, you know, you're checking products, you're driving an electric vehicle, you're protecting whitehouse.gov, you're powering, you know, you cannot break a world record if Red Panda isn't up and running. Mm -hmm. that, that was Act One for Red Panda. And then last year when we bought the connector company, it allows us to sort of expand into the space where we can now bring data into the platform and help uh, effectively businesses be get more value out of the platform, right? So sort of be more successful in production. So you're, you're, you're basically saying that AI is now the biggest use case in data streaming, and you're aiming the company not just at the legacy workloads that are currently using Kafka, but you know, at the future, at where data streaming is going. Yeah, most applications are going to be built on a three-tiered structure. Your operational layer, you need a, you need a business, you have to be able to interact and respond to requests. Mm -hmm. Your analytical data, which is like, let me look at the past so yep. I could, you know, do my job better. And then a layer of autonomy. And so w the, the way I'm thinking about the future is that every business will add a level of autonomy to their existing applications. And this is where Red Panda shines because of the last six years of infrastructure that we've been building, whether it's the connectors mm -hmm. or whether it's Red Panda, the storage or it's BYOC, there's like hard pillars where we're leaned in early. Um, and so I'm just stoked about where, where you know. So already, already generating a massive market in the operational workloads and, and soon analytical workloads as well. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, uh, you know, this act two will be about jumping into that third that third tier. Yeah, which is adding autonomy to every business. Yep. Fantastic. In real time talking to you, it takes me back to our first meeting and uh, I remember, you know, the very first time that we connected and being on the call with you. So, we heard about you through people in our network and ended up getting connected. Eric Nordlander, my partner in New York, and I had teamed previously on Cockroach, and uh, we're often the folks that are talking to data-intensive companies. And he was on a call in New York, and I was on the call in, I think, Woodside. It was during COVID. We are chatting with you uh, in San Francisco. And I remember within 15 minutes, Eric and I are texting, uh, one, this human's incredible. Like Alex's background is, you know, when you talk about founder product fit or founder market fit or founder venture capitalist fit, like all of those things were like 10 out of 10 for GV. We're super excited. It's like, how do we get to work with this human? And then two, what he is saying to us that the world is becoming more real time, that streaming is growing, that data is intensive. These all support theses that we have about where the world is headed. And this is all pre ChatGPT and AI yeah. taking off, right? My first impressions were like off the charts excited, and and um, you know you've lived up to those expectations. But I'm curious, uh, what were your first few impressions of GV, and like how do you think about a call like that as a founder? I, I really wanted to build a long term relationship, and I think is perhaps just my personality. I would rather have fewer relationships that last decades, mm. uh, you know, or whatever, forever, potentially. And so I think what we connected on that was really meaningful to me was 
I think this this relentless drive to actually figure things out. And so I was talking to Sarah, my partner, and I was giving her this analogy. I was like, hey, in, in school, I was fortunate to be mentored by one of the internet founders and he said something to me that always stuck and I just like immediately at, at, attached it to our conversation, which was there are these people that do their homework and then there's another group of people that that don't for, for real reasons and, and real excuses. And you sort of want to be associated with the people that can do and somehow figure out a way to do their work. And I was like, I felt to me like that was a good, that was just the feeling that I got mm. when, when we finished the conversation. I was like, I feel like Dave is gonna help me figure things out when, mm. when things get wrong and, and like he's part of this group of people that figure things out. So like that's the kind of human that I wanna partner with for a long time. I know we, we have jumped around a little bit, but I wanted to zero in on uh, another aspect of, of just working together that's been really fantastic, which is uh, your development you know, over time as uh, you know, from, from an IC engineer uh, to the leader of a startup, to now somebody who's running a massive, uh, massive, large private company, and like you can speak to every level of the stack, including the sort of company strategy. Um, that has been a, a journey for you, and I guess I'd love to talk through like your history. Like, what what were the experiences that you had that were sort of uh, critical to get you from you know kid growing up in Colombia to uh, you know today? I have always seen myself as a builder and so you know growing up i think i've shared this with you personally my uncle had this motorcycle shop and i was really young and we would take this like real racing motorcycles dirt bikes and he goes like alex take it apart and i would whatever i would go and find wrenches until i was able to take apart this engine i was like eight and so i was putting taking the engines apart putting them back together and that like sense of accomplishment. I was like, I could do this with my two hands, was super free. And so when I started the company, um, I remember I was pitching this idea to Sarah and Sarah's always believed that's why we're married. <laughs> so um, uh, she goes like, oh, hey, this is a great idea. But when I would share it outside, people were like, oh, I don't know, why, why would you do this? Da, 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 da. Like there's another company right. who's doing great. And so as a builder, I was like, look, I don't have to ask anyone for permission. I could just go and build it. And that was have been super empowering. It's not surprising to me. I mean, uh, we have in you someone who can articulate the vision and then break it all the way down to the role that each person is in. And so I think inspiring for people to work for somebody that's as technical as you are and then also has the big vision. It sounded you were talking about repairing motorcycles. So being able to break things all the way down to first principles sort of as you were as you're growing up but there's also an element to uh you know you're talking about dirt bikes to take risks i remember uh our our head of recruiting uh reese went on a uh like a mountain biking yeah. ride with you and he came back and said like all right all of these things that you say about alex they're all true he's incredible but he's also like the amount of risk that he is willing to ingest on a daily basis is is absolutely wild uh, as somebody who used to jump out of airplanes and, and has been through a lot of risky situations, what is it that's different about you that enables you to both break things all the way down to bare metal, to you know, the first principles understanding, and also take massive amounts of risk? And, um, and how should we think about that in you as, as a leader? It's been difficult to articulate over the years, but what I found... Um, when you start, you know, when you grow up, you always have the heroes, the people that you read in, in books. And then you meet them. I was like, this person is not smarter than my friend. You know what I mean? It's that, that realization. I was like, well, why not me? Why can't I be the MVP? Why can't I win the league? And so it's having a little bit of confidence in that, like, most of the time you're going to grind. Uh, it's just like the, the life of, you know, I guess being a CEO is like you're sort of the center of where like a lot of the problems bubble up. And by the time they bubble up to you, they, they tend to be a little larger than, mm -hmm. than, than regular. And so having the confidence that you'll figure it out and then um, having met and, but, you know, confidence is built through like, okay, you're prepared. You kind of, you know, you have these little wins and these little moments in time. Uh, but why not, why not us? You know, why, why can't we change how the world is built? And it's, there's always this weird, I think, first imposter syndrome when you start building systems. Uh, but when the largest electric car company is building, you know, autonomous vehicles on top of you, I was like, Okay, well, we actually did manage to change in a real way how the world is built. Or when, you know, I remember there was a pilot uh, a space shuttle company that that put Red Panda software and shipped it to outer space. And I was like, 
I don't know many companies that have actually shipped software to outer space, and it just it blew my mind. And so uh, I think through these little wins mm -hmm. of confidence, but like real confidence, you know, based on like an engineer thought through the systems and decided that this is the best way for them to move forward, or the largest payment company in the world, I think moving a trillion dollars a month or in a few billion dollars a day, um, is moving to Japan, and you're like, you know, we, we could do this. Like, those are the things that in many ways allow you to take bigger risk and, and continue to bet on yourself. Perhaps being an immigrant, it's, it's been helpful in like taking a chance on, on you. Perhaps my mom was a single mom, you know, and so she was like, hey, you have to like run this. And so I remember uh, having a little less than, than others. And, um, and then you just kind of have to figure it out. There is really no backup plan. There is no plan two. There is like, Alex, there is plan one. A story I'll share, which is I showed up for college and I was living in America by myself. And so I get accepted and there was a mistake in the admissions plan and I thought it was gonna be the following semester and I was working this administration job in, in uh, Connecticut and I get accepted to go to school in New York. And they gave me this massive scholarship. And so, uh, but I had to quit my job close the lease of my apartment and show up to New York. I didn't even know what a financial aid was, what like what it meant to get a loan or anything like that. And I was like, you know, this is the right thing to do. And so I go on Craigslist. I was like, everything is free. I get rid of all my stuff in 24 hours. I quit the next day. I take a day to prep. I buy like a 70 pound bag. I was like, those are all the worldly positions I have. I'm going to show up to school and I miss the induction day where they like teach you where the dorms were and like where everything was. So I have no idea. I show up late to my first class with no money and just a bag in the dorms. I was like, well, like we have to figure this out. And so I go to the financial aid office and they're like, okay, like you have to pay. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, I thought you get a loan. And so I had to figure out eventually how to get a loan and how, you know, whatever. We made it work. Yeah. But the point was like, uh, it was like, it, it's like the, the, I didn't have a backup plan. I showed up with a bag to school uh, with no backup in New York, no, no apartment, just the clothes that I was wearing and like a little bit of change and, and that was it. And, and so I, I don't know, maybe it's a personality, but it's yeah. like, if I'm doing one thing, then I'm all in and it's doing sort of like the hard things first. You mentioned Sarah, I think the two of you together are a superpower and now your whole family, I think like together <laughs> is a superpower. Uh, but I just think the way that you show up for other people is super long-term oriented in a way that, so at GV, we talk about, you know, decades, not years or centuries, not decades. We think about people in the long arc of their journey as founders. When we think about investors, we value the folks whose founders have chosen them to, to invest in the first round of their second company and their third company and their fourth company, because that tells me you are a true partner to someone else, you're deeply mm -hmm. trusted, not you're the right person at the right time and can help them do a thing. Totally. Because the reality is these things all change. Over and I time. think the way that like you've showed up for me, I'm not sure if you remember, but during the first call, I said, I was like, hey, I wanna be the CEO of this company forever. Like, you know, I grew up as an engineer and, um, but for Red Panda, mm -hmm. I am the CEO. Yep. And you're like, I'm gonna support you for as long as, as you need to. And what's been critical for me as like, you know, growing up uh, from a technical, you know, founder mm -hmm. to actually running almost a 200 person company now mm -hmm. has been um, this like timely introductions for me to be able to evolve who I am as a leader. You know, first it was attaching, um, it was being like, I, I grew up, I guess, being uh, excellent, I think from a technical aptitude perspective, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what it takes to run a company. I didn't know what a great CFO was like, or a great, uh, you know, CRO would look like, or a great head of people. And I think that uh, you've invested in me as an individual over a long period of time now, I think six years together. And it's like, hey, this is how you should run your board meetings. I think that ability to level set and I think consistently investing in me has been something that frankly, I think it's made me better. And as like taking a step back as a leader, my identity was attached to that of being a good builder. Like, yeah. you know, personally, you know, I think I've guess I've always cared so deeply about the stuff that I've worked on that it was like, you know, the, the stuff that I built was in many ways like 
uh, was like Alex's identity. Like right. it, it was really deeply attached. And so as like as I shift my identity in, in now running a company, I still think of myself as a builder. But totally. something that I think GV in particular has done really well is is allowed me to level set. I was like, this is actually what great looks like, and you thought it was here, but it's actually here. But it's also a stage appropriate, right? It doesn't make any sense for me to go and recruit a public person company when we're a 200 person organization growing super fast, mm -hmm. right? And so having that that like ability to introduce me to people that are great, that are still stage appropriate, where it always feels a little bit of a stretch, uh, has been, I think, a key component of continuously helping Red Panda grow at this, you mentioned at this crucible moment. So I was like, look, the company is about to grow or go through a, a transition period. And um, and like, this is the right leader for that, or this is right. The, the right type of archetype. Um, and so I think, it, GV has always been really generous in introducing me to the entire network. My orientation towards founders is always that we want to invest in people who uh, can run the company over the long arc of the business. So as a public company in the public markets. And I remember that first conversation you had you had previously exited a, a company, you founded a company and then exited to a big public company. Uh, you know, great, great business. And, um, and your question was like, you know, I, I want to run the company over the long arc of it. Is that something you're you're mm -hmm. on board for? And I remember saying to you, like, we wouldn't invest in you unless we thought you had the skill set to be a big public company uh, CEO. And I mean, I see that even more so today than yesterday and two <laughs> weeks ago. And like, I can't wait for you to be running a big public company. We feel super excited about the future. I think for us, it's it's humbling and to me i feel like it's an honor to be able to partner with the world's largest companies building the most demanding workloads for mission critical systems and you know using red panda and the systems that we've built in many ways it feels like a dream come true for me where like you start out with this fragile idea of like hey maybe we can change the world in a small way and then when when the you know these people that like run the world uh use your system it's just like it never gets old. For me, that's one of the best things about being a founder is when you go, I was at uh, Amazon reInvent and we had the largest Midwest um, manufacturing company. Um, and so, you know, I think it's like whatever, $6 billion of revenue a year. The CIO comes up and it's like, I just want to let you know that you changed how we build the systems here. Thank you. You uh, actually delivered the things that you said and went beyond, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And you know, and then you talk about very tactical things, and like that to me, even if the account was ten thousand dollars, even if you know if it wasn't a million dollars, whatever. Like those moments for me just give me unlimited energy. Super honored to partner with you, and uh, it's been really fun to hang out. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking the time.